Hey everybody, welcome to uh, episode three of the uh, audio webinar series. Um, my name is Ricky Cook and I'm here with my friends, uh, starting with Madeline Van Campen. Uh, she does monitors for a lot of our uh, Hillsong events. She also tours with Young and Free, Hillsong Worship, um, and helps me as the um, audio, like sort of project coordinator for uh, Hillsong conferences. We've got Andrew Crawford, uh, 20 plus year veteran. Um, history with uh, Hillsong Music Australia was a record engineer, mix engineer, producer on a lot of our albums. And he is our go-to front of house engineer. Um, and then we've got Justin Arthur as well. Juzzy is our systems engineer and uh, he travels the world doing some large scale events and uh, puts together some epic patch rigs, as you can see behind him. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about patch. So um, this whole series is kind of put together and kind of based on the fact that because uh, we're not, be, we won't be doing Hillsong conference this year. We're kind of, going through the process and, and taking everyone for, on the journey of what it would be like if we were to be putting on Hillsong Conference this year and uh, what's involved and the steps that we go through. Um, so first week we talked about PA design and how we, how we work with the creative team and, you know, um, with the stage design and working around of all of that sort of stuff. And uh, last year, uh, sorry, last year, last week, we talked about um, the digital audio transport, um, so how we drive, how we get signal to the PA, how we get signal to and from the consoles uh, and from the stage racks and how we get signals long distance to our broadcast suites that are uh, for our remote production. And, um, and this week, we're pretty much going to go to the other side of the stage racks and we're going to talk about the analog side. Um, so, but what we're going to talk about is, is the way we assemble the patch documents and the everything, I guess the everything from the way we assemble the patch documents all the way through to the microphone choices and why there are certain choices and things like that. And, um, you know, and, and a lot of it's going to be sort of from a front of house perspective and then from a monitor's perspective, which Matto will speak into a lot. And then, and, uh, and I'll, I'll talk to a degree on the broadcast perspective and, and we'll talk about how we, uh, you know, the, the systems we use and the systems we've developed over the years and how the things that we feel like we've got right and the things we feel like we didn't get right. Uh, and we've definitely improved on those over the years. And we certainly had our fair share of sort of, uh, you know, hmm, we'll never do that again moments, haven't we, Croft? Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so uh, getting stuck into it. Um, I would say the, uh, the evolution of... Uh, our patch system and our patch documents has it, it's it hasn't it hasn't come a long way i feel like uh, it's um and i've got to give credit where credit's due with the layout and format of the original patch doc and um you know i said you know between sort of ucroft and and brad law uh i think it started with kev watts if we actually go back yeah. i think kev started it then, then I took over it and, and I left. I used to just leave lots of, I call them like last year's turds in it. Yep. And then Brad Law would always find those and fix them. Yep. You know, because yeah. I just, I was Mr. King of cut and paste in a hurry. Yeah. And, and I would turn it into a mess and then Brad <laughs> would fix it. So then Brad decided he just needed to own it. Yeah. Uh, and the world was a better place. Yeah. It was a, it was a tidier place. <laughs> Every, everything was neat, organized. The same yep. font was used. The same yes. size text was used. Yes. The right color palette choice was used. Yes. So, yeah, there was um, yeah, it went through a lot of evolutions, and uh, and we we've we still we still use that style of spreadsheet to this day, um, be it with a few tweaks. I kind of set a bit of a challenge to um, one of our sort of uh, our previous um, Hills Audio guys and front of house engineers, um, Omar, a couple of years ago, where I was like, let's take the let's take our standard of patch doc and let's add a degree of automation. So at the end of the, at the end of the list, it'll tell us how many microphones of, you know, how many SM 57s we need, how many 58s we need, how many RH types of mic stands, how many RA 20s we need. That's it. Just, just we just need all of them. All of them. Yeah. DIs. If ever, yeah, exactly. DI choices. Um, even down to like, um, if we wanted, if we wanted to go to the granular detail, how many, um, 
what how the quantity and the lengths of the mic leads like all of that sort of stuff which kind of made for um the rental company for g point productions it made it a whole lot easier for prep and things like that now sometimes it worked sometimes it didn't um and then um we kind of went through a phase where a whole lot more was becoming digital. So once upon a time, everything was analog and it just went to stage racks and we were, you know, we were mostly happy when it wasn't buzzing and noisy and things like that. But um, there was a, there was a period there where we were slowly, and we discussed this last week, we were slowly bringing sort of like the video guys over um, and moving them onto a digital platform, which meant now we had to sort of think about how we documented patch because not, not every line of the patch doc represented a, a chain of XLRs somewhere or a, a you know, multi pin connectors. So yeah. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to share. Okay. First of all, I'm going to quickly share my screen. Um, actually what I'll do is Croft talk about the old days. The good old days. Oh, well, the old days, it was, it, yeah, 100% it was analog patch. You know, yeah. it was world of, you know, uh, XLRs and many splits and uh, a company called JPJ had these uh, transformer plates. So everything yeah. would come off stage. And bear in mind, we were already, Juzzy, it's got to be, what, a 50-meter run but by the time you've got from stage to these plates? Yeah, on average, it would be about 50 You meters. know? Um, and so then, so that's 50 meters of cable. And then it's another pretty much, you know, it's more than a hundred to get to the front of house position yeah. and you're going through splits and everything's all getting, yeah, it's close you to know, 20. So, so, you know, your microphone at the other end, everything sounded like it had tissue paper on it, you know, <laughs> um, you just brightened everything up on your EQ strips. Yeah. Um, but that it was, was it, that was on PAs that couldn't do all the way up to 20k <laughs> efficiently. No, so yeah, it, it was a challenge, um, and you know, and we used to also have lots of guests. So in the in the spreadsheet, when you have a look at it, um, when Ricky flicks it up, we always used to, and it's and it's pretty standard for festivals and other things. We'd have like a master patch of the inputs, and then we'd overlay all the guests, give them their own tab. Um, and, you know, try and originally try and figure out how to make the guests work within our line system. And then that turned into totally separate guest line systems. Um, and some years that would be two guest line systems, depending how that worked. Um, and then the Hillsong system. Um, and that definitely was a, a win when we went to having a dedicated Hillsong line system in the analog days. Because every time you unplugged or removed something, you just you were then just chasing it, you know? Um, yeah. So that, that helped having a dedicated, helped us anyway, have a dedicated Hillsong line system. It was, um, and uh, what about the pre JPG years? Oh, okay. So back to lots of what's soccer picks. Yeah. And then, well, so um, lots of what's was a company that had this 12 channel soccer pick system it was actually designed by PA people. Um, and yeah, that was, you like know, a struggle within itself. Everything um, was 12 channels though. It's not, you don't, it's not just 12 channels off stage to your split racks. And then it was bulk 56 channels from there. It was 12 channels off stage to your split racks, 12 channels lots from there to your consoles. Yes. So there was lots of cables. Yes. Yes. And heavy cables. And, yeah. Uh, and then I remember early on, we ended up, a uh, couple of one or two years with those BSS splits in there. Yep. And then we went to a whole bunch of Clark active splits. Um, and that definitely helped us. When we went to the Clark active splits, having like a mic pre, if you're ever a young familiar, um, these Clark splits actually had a mic pre in them and you could add gain right there. And that definitely helped improve the sound. Um, I remember. Yeah. Um, they were like a, um, it was almost, it was like a Midas pre yeah, um, to a degree. And it definitely, it would actually help, uh, especially impedance wise, actually load match with the, the mic that's plugged into that mic pre. Yeah. And then you took a, a uh, you know, a, um, 
like a padded down output of that line level and then drove that up your 100, 120 meters, which for the Americans is 300, 350 feet of, uh, you know, analog copper multi-core. Yeah. Um, which in the, yeah, it is, it is really, it was. Uh, well, actually, I mean, the thing is, there was, that was how it was done. It's mm. just, it was just normal. Um, so, what the heck? yeah. Well, so, that was the and, resource available. That, yes. Exactly, yep. Um, not not the, only that. I was just going to say, the first time we actually had the PM1Ds, and then obviously PM5Ds had the XLRs on the back of them, but even with the PM1Ds, we ran the brains, because no one knew at this stage, like it was all new, and P, PM1Ds had these uh, crazy SCSI cables. So we ran analog all the way up to front of house and had the PM1D brain at front of house and plugged it in because no one had 100 meter SCSI cables. That's right. <laughs> Until someone made them. <laughs> Until yeah. we made our own. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, that, those SCSI cables, like they were, they were basic, they were actually SCSI cables, but at the end of the day, they just ran pairs of AS3, lots and lots of AS3. And the control cable was a pair of 50 ohm coaxes mm-hmm. with BNCs on each end, which was just archaic, but... <laughs> that was pretty modern. That was pretty cool when it came yeah. out. Yep. Um, yes. And you kind of looked at the connector and you're like, we're going to tour that? Or yep. yeah, sorry. <laughs> that's not going to last. Yeah, um, it was pretty cool. So, um, guys, feel free to ask questions in the chat. Um, also, just, you know, just shout out where are you from? What time zone are you in? How crazy late are you staying up? And what sound um, effects you want next week? I'm going to get a sound effects board next week. So I can Ooh, have like sound a, effects. Like an iPad. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to yeah. sit here and ding, you know. Wah, wah. <laughs> That's it. So, all right. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'll quickly share. Um, actually, Juzzy, hmm. what you should do is, on because we're on the theme of patch, tell us about what what room are you sitting in right now virtually? Uh, what what so event be, was that? Behind me, that uh, is half of the patch room um, for... Baku 2017, uh, was it the European Games, I think, um, in Azerbaijan. Um, and what you're looking at behind me is basically the analog side of the system um, over there. So typically in those scenarios, we run a full digital oh, system. They're the clocks, right? They're the clocks. They're the clocks. Uh, so about. what Croft was talking about, they're the clock splits. Yeah. So typically we'd run a, a fully digital system um, backed up by a, a a mirror identical analog system. Um, so yeah, there's probably, I can't remember now, over 600 channels of analog um, through the stadium there. Yeah. <laughs> and that, the, yes. the um, and because we discussed it, we talked about the digital system you used for that right, last week. Yeah, optical. Yeah. Yep. Mm. Yes. So yeah, so right. it's basically. That's insane. So those those events, and this is like um, this is a, a specification by the audio designer and the technical director of Olympic ceremonies, where there shall be there there shall never be a single point of failure. Yeah, everything's redundant. Everything has a a pair, yeah, you know, a pair of consoles. Um, yeah, even down to the point where performers, if they're wearing a headset, we will heat trick two headsets together with two wireless belt packs and two separate receivers. Um, yeah. So there's never a single thing that can stop. But those receivers get split, and one split, one one will feed the optical system, or they'll both feed optical, and they'll both feed the analog. Yep. And, and they'll then, be on different ends of the stadium. Yeah, and then those yeah. optical and analog lines, lines, <laughs> will end up at two different sets of consoles. Yep. Same console, sure. they're mirrored, but yep. they'll enter them two different ways. So effectively, if anything goes wrong in the digital system, you just step up and move over to the analog system. And if anything goes wrong, you know, you probably, yeah. the, the, the digital system's the primary system, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah the analog system primary, is the ultimate failover. We, we work very hard to make it almost seamless. You know, you push that button that flips over to the other system and it's like, did something change? No? Okay, good. No. Wow. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that changeover happens right at the amplifier? Yeah, at the very last point. Yeah. Um, and that's distributed. So, you know, there's not one box which changes everything. There are multiple boxes yeah. distributed throughout the system. So if any one box fails, you don't take out the whole system 
only one tiny little quadrant would go. Yeah, that's right. So I can manually go and take care of that. Yeah, distributed risk. Distributed mm. risk, that's it. And that's what, that's the kind of effort you go to for those size, for that scale of event. So that is, that is Olympic ceremony size, which is, at, uh, I can't think of anything that would be, is there, an, is there any event that would be bigger? Mm. Hard to say. No, Depends what maybe, you mean by bigger. Yeah, well, that's, I'm not talking about crowds of people. I'm talking about just caliber of the event, the level of broadcast, um, you know, the amount of viewers watching on screen, like, because like you said, so those, those two, that headset where you literally heat shrink a second headset, <coughs> that's also going to air, mm. right? So that's going um, to broadcast. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's going to broadcast. So that's the, the host broadcasters require that. Um, and even they're fully redundant as well. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so crazy. I mean, mm. we're definitely not talking about that scale when it comes to <laughs> Hillsong Conference, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, we still have our redundancy strategies we Definitely. do we do yeah. even, even if it includes Jazzy like running down the arena <laughs> <laughs> but th uh, there's lots of things that we aspire to from those yeah, type definitely. from that you know and this is what we were talking about sort of almost um, right at the beginning just before we jumped online Ricky where you know we aspire to that but we're in this church world with a lot of volunteers where we have this great intention we've got a great document but very quickly you know the document can turn into the book of lies because you know it's 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 the more please can i have just one more channel please one more vocal <laughs> and yeah. and you do all your best intentions to to have this great document and a plan but the creatives at the last minute you know just need that extra vocal and you know ricky's there with some y splits and mm. you know <laughs> <laughs> yep sometimes it's y combines yep <laughs> just trying to jam one more input in Yep. So, uh, Pop yeah, point one. that's it. I'm going to have a quick, um, I'm going to quickly share this window I've got open now. It's, um, it's a little arrogant because it's kind of, it's my Instagram account on the web, but <laughs> it actually, I couldn't, it's the fastest way I could find a photo of the patch uh, area when we used to have a hectic amount of stuff. Um, so let me, uh, we also just got a question, which is very good. Um, yep. Do we plan for such redundancies for Sunday services around various campuses? Okay. Well, yeah. Okay. Let's talk about that. Um, yes and no. So sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. So we don't, obviously we don't, ha front of house doesn't have two consoles. Monitors doesn't have two consoles. Uh, for the locate, like for the Hills campus, which has got broadcast uh, suites we don't have two broadcast consoles but we have failover we have we have backup strategies uh plans so um look if the monitor console fails front of house can take over the the floor monitors the wedges uh and drive those however the band simply just can't go on stage because you can't drive all of the iems um it's as simple as that so someone can still get up and speak and that's fine um obviously the the band can't go up, but that's, so that's obviously a pretty tragic hit to the service. However, the thing is someone can still get up there and someone can still speak. So they'll still be spoken word and they'll still have monitors for themselves. Um, so things like uh, redundancy to, for the PA. Um, so we have, uh, most of our venues are all Adamson. So they're all powered by lab group and PLMs. Um, so typically there will be analog and Dante so Dante being the primary source, analog being the failover. Um, and you might go through a bunch of, you know, there might be a couple of like, you know, LMs or something in the chain. Um, and given that it's Dante, obviously you're going through a ethernet network. Uh, whereas the, the analog redundancy to the amplifiers will simply be from the, either from a, a stage rack or from the console itself straight down um, if it's up to the roof or down under the floor or wherever the amplifiers are and literally just daisy chained as simple and as dumb as it can possibly be with no active electronics in between because again that is the alt like if you have to fail over to that something's gone horribly wrong mm. but at least you'll still have audio yeah. okay and, uh, and we go to the effort of, of game matching that so if it does fail over 
it might sound a little different, but it's not going to be like all of a sudden the PA goes up by six dB or falls by six dB because that'd be really obvious. So it's analog, yeah. so it's just warmer, isn't it? Yeah, it sounds warmer. Right. <laughs> exactly. Less less top end, but warmer. Mm. Um, so no, we are, and, and so for things like okay, so for example, in uh, locations that are broadcast based locations, um, for example, if broadcast were to fail or go off air, uh, the broadcast engineer. Uh, as in the video tech broadcast engineer has um, has a macro trigger. Um, so we use a system called VSM, Virtual Studio Manager, that controls all of our video and broadcast infrastructure in every venue across the uh, in all of our primary venues across the country. Um, and that's like a big um, sort of software defined router controller. So. Um, and what that enables us to do is basically, you know, have a single button trigger, which will trigger the, all the feeds from that require. So for example, all of the video recorders, uh, web feeds, external room feeds, all of that, it'll fail over from broadcast to front of house um, and go through a degree of processing. So it's level matched. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's not, obviously there's not ultimate redundancy in place, but there is strategies in place for varying degrees of redundancy, you know, along, along the way. Nice. Um, so yeah, um, we don't, something we do need to work on is, is testing that a lot more because you don't want to get to the point where you need that failover and you push the button and it, nothing happens. That is so key. Yeah. That is key. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, I know the stuff that Juzzy's done, uh, you know, I've done a little bit of it myself in the past, quite a few, like back in like 2006, um, so that is like, I remember we spent like a week flip-flopping to the point, and the front house engineer didn't know which network he was using. He didn't know whether exactly. it was on Opticore yeah. or analog. He had no idea. Neither the monitor engineer had no idea. He didn't realize that the console he was pushing faders on wasn't actually passing audio. It was just remotely controlling the console next to it that was, you know, and back then it was PM1Ds everywhere. Mm. And all yeah. they were was literally MIDI cables joining the PM1Ds together. It was so <laughs> basic. Wow. Uh, you basic know, so but reliable. Basic but reliable, <laughs> that's right, yeah. Which is what it had to be because you can't afford to have, you can't afford to lose audio. You can't afford to go off air. Uh, you just can't afford to take that risk. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I hope that answers the question. But um, I'll yeah. just quickly uh, share this screen. Okay, so the hopefully Insta. you guys... Sorry? You saying the Insta's back. Yep. Yep. There it is. So, um, yeah, see, I mean, that's, I don't know when that is. It's dating back. Uh, what is it? July 2016. 2016. There you go. So yeah. as you can see, if you can zoom in, it's a really bad photo, but um, those were the Studer racks yeah. for the broadcast truck. This was before yes. we, this was before we had dark fiber and we could send audio anywhere we wanted. Yeah. Um, they were, uh, they were is SD it, racks. Right? Yeah, three SDs. Me, yeah. That looks like one of the first years where we still had dual pre's. All we, we had guests. Yeah. Well, we had um, well, exactly. So, uh, from memory, that was pair of SD racks, pair of SD racks, pair of SD racks. Oh my gosh. Um, I think they're profile racks, actually. Those ones. But anyway, yeah. Oh, those ones, the M ones. Yeah, yeah they are too. Yeah. You're right. I can see that little card there. Yeah, that's right. Um. We had, uh, those were the They're the uh, square ones. Square one splits, that's it. The yeah. Clark square ones. Um, and they were two by 56 channel racks. All of this stuff is from uh, Qpoint Productions, by the way. Um, then we had, uh, we would have had whirlwinds somewhere. Well, that, that's the radials in that where Sorry. your mouse is to the right. Yep. Um, which is the Hillsong splits. And then that's right. on yep. top of oh, the was the square guess. ones. Um, that's the, the Jans 20 ways. Yeah, I was going to say. That's that right. Good. Yep. Uh, that's for the guest. Mate, your memory is so good. <laughs> um, and then over here we have RF. Uh, that <laughs> The patch dock, always open. Um, you yep. know, feed, feeds from the video boys. Uh, Bradley himself, the, yep. the team. Um, was that the year? So un we, was that the year we had another set of stage racks underneath those? Yeah, there's SDs under there yeah. um, for the record truck. For the record truck, that's right. The record truck wow. 
was an SD7 with an expander. Yep. Yeah, it's a big SD7. Um, yeah, so that was cool. Mm. One thing, That's just because cool. you mentioned the patch dock, yep. and obviously, you know, we, we, you said earlier it was XL, you mm -hmm. know, one of the, obviously, you know, the biggest changes or, I don't know, what do you want to call it, benefits is the whole fact, that, you know, doing it now in a Google Doc and you can share it and give permission and people can get to it in real time because um, that's been one of the, on, on a, an event like Hillsong Conference, you know, information can change so quickly. Yeah, oh, it turned yeah. into a collaborative yeah. effort. Yeah. That used to be a real thing, didn't it? You'd, you'd print the document and by the time you've bought it from the printer in front of the house, it's different. It's changed. Yeah, yeah it does, right. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we basically, I think at some point we were like, never print this document because yep. it's wrong. Yep. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, the yeah, moment it comes out of the printer, it's wrong. Take. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Um, oh, I see another question there. What happens if VSM goes offline? Uh, there is multiple VSM servers uh, in multiple locations. Um, yeah. If VSM ever went offline, where, uh, where, um, we're up a creek without a paddle. Uh, <laughs> But VSM is built to not go offline. It is, um, yeah, it's pretty robust. It's used in a lot of TV studios around the world, right? For the old audio guy, what's VSM? Oh, okay, so it's like a, it's like the, it's like the. Okay, so VSM is like a control layer for all of your routers and all of your equipment, and so everything like that. So, for example, we've got last week I. You might have remembered, if you want to go back and watch the YouTube video, I drew, um, you know, a pair of Lavo Nova 73s in the Hills campus, one in the convention center and one in the epicenter. Both those routers are controlled from VSM. So, and then hanging off those, we've got like different Dante domains and things like that. Um, VSM can control the routing within the Dante domains too. So you don't, to, to change a route within Dante, you don't open Dante controller. Uh, there's a virtual machine running... Uh, a device, a, an application called Gadget Server, which effectively is like a relay, a proxy between what Dante controller would do and the VSM controller. And what would happen is, for example, say if I've got I've got a signal in one building and I want to get it to the other building, and I've got to go from hypothetically from Dante to Maddie uh, into one of the big core into one of the big facility routers across the network across IP to another facility router out via Dante and hit a, a, a recorder. That would be one, two, three, at least four cross points I would have to actually go and open the controllers for and click those, right? So I'd have to crack open my laptop, go, okay, I need Dante controller for this VLAN. So, you know, and here's the cross point. And then, you know, router number one, router number two, and Dante domain number 47, click, you know, that's four places I have to click it. With VSM, I just choose the source and the destination and I click it once and VSM stitches the path up for me. Okay, so it automates that process. Um, so yeah, that was a, it's a, it's a time saver. It means that I only have to go to one place to see all of the routing the various routing domains and i mean you got to talk like you got to think that um the facility routers are both of our facility routers are ten thousand square each so that's ten thousand potential cross points each um sorry ten thousand square that's ten thousand inputs ten thousand outputs each so you know 10 k square is um yeah it's a decent size audio router uh and when you look at it like there is there's 512 channels of tie line between them uh there's 512 channels of ravenna there's 32 ports of maddie in one of them um i think there's like 32 ports of maddie in the other one too um you know so there's just stuff everywhere um and then when you get into the more of the ip world with our v links and v remotes and everything else that's talking as 67 or ravenna um you've got to you need something to also manage the IP tie lines as well. So all of the SDP exchange that's happening to, you know, it's just, there's a whole lot of, there's an awful lot of audio being transported around and you need 
so I'm going to manage that. <laughs> it sounds like a clocking nightmare. It is. Uh-huh. It actually is. I will be the first person to tell you it is a clocking nightmare. But if we want to talk about clocking, it's all synchronized to GPS uh, because it has to be. It means that um, when I send a signal from here to Brisbane, it needs to be in sync. And when Brisbane sends a signal back to me, it, the frequency still needs to be the same. So our, our versions of 48K need to be identical. And the only way we're going to, you know, we can't run a word clock. I can't run a word clock cable from Sydney to Brisbane. But what I can do is I can reference the GPS satellites and Brisbane can reference the GPS satellites, which will pulse perfect. Like a, a one, they'll do a one second pulse perfectly. So that is the single source of truth when it comes to time. And then from that, you can derive uh, 48K, 96K, 25 frames per second, 50 frames per second, all of that sort of stuff. So, yeah, it's a bit of a clocking nightmare, especially when you get into the IP world and you've got to deal with PTP and all that fun stuff. Um, it could be a whole other week, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we could talk about that forever. Um, so what I'll do is we'll go back to good old trusty analog and I'll, um, I'll quickly share... Uh, Oops, nope. Oh man, technology's hard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you got Excel, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is a. I um as I'm scrolling through this, I thought, oh yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we'll pull up last year's. It'll be good. And then I realised that this one doesn't actually have have much information filled in, but <laughs> it's got what we need. <laughs> so we could fill it in as we go. I could, yeah. We could. Yeah. We could make it. Um. So what we'll do is we'll look at um, the, so in Excel, anyone who's sort of familiar with Excel knows that you can split, do a split plane. So you can um, essentially take your spreadsheet and split it in two and allow you to scroll discreetly. Um, for last year, we didn't have guest band wise. We were our own guests. Um, yeah, as weird as that sound. United. It was United, yeah, yeah. It was United. So we had um, worship slash house band uh, Hillsong United, and obviously Hillsong Young and Free didn't attend. Oh yeah, no, but they were. This they was were. again. This is a perfect example of we planned for it, mm-hmm. and I feel yeah. like I don't know if you remember Mads. It was only the call. Only it was like the week of conference where they said, "Oh no, nah, we're just going to keep it at you know yeah. United thing and Young and they Free turned it into an item hard. or something." Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's yeah. right. But it was, of which then they fell into the house patch. Yeah. yeah. But we still had to plan for it. I remember we, that was, that's why it's in the document. Oh, it's um, still there. So at any time, uh, you know, Nate, yeah. the young and free front house guy could literally go and drop in the, the line list and, yeah. uh, and we can accommodate for it. Mm. So, yeah. So the way it works is it's simple. It's pretty, I mean, it's simple. It's pretty simple. Um, you have all of your stage inputs, the relevant microphones, the type of stands that are used, and where it says stage, that's the stage box, the physical stage box that the XLR is going to plug into. Okay. Um, normally, this is, this is definitely through a sort of half-built process. Normally, by once we're finished, I would go through and color code that. You know, I'd go through and make that brown, for example. Um, oops, that was text, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Good on me. You know, I'd go through and yeah. make that brown because it's the first box. So... That's effectively, you know, go through this whole manual process of color coding everything, you know, go and make all the text white so you can still read it and voila. So. An interesting, I'm just going to throw one interesting thing that I always do because I mixed far too many shows on PM5Ds. Mm -hmm. I keep everything odd even. So as soon as, and it's not as important nowadays, but then also just I never wanted in the olden days you had to, you didn't want to overrun one converter to another converter. So yeah. I just keep everything on that odd to weave in and don't let things run over, you know. Exactly. Lots. So perfect example. And, and most of us do that just because we're old. That's it. So perfect example here is like they, they are uh, they're 12 channel stage boxes. So we wouldn't let things like um, things like drum pads or the overhead mics if you were to go if you were to run them as stereo channels you would leave them as odd to even you know what i mean so yeah that yeah. comes from mainly from yamaha as well i think yeah, PM5D. only PM5D, channel PM5D. one and two you couldn't yeah. do a two and three so you had to exactly. make sure you play yeah. for that yeah and we kind of we kind of maintain that but what what we then 
gave the freedom to do was to, uh, this is sort of stemming back to those days where we used to run, uh, when we say we used to, I, I wasn't, I was a, um, oh no, I dragged some articles around. No, that's right. Yeah. I was um, pretty, pretty far down the chain back in those days. So the, um, so console IO, for example, if this was back on um, PM5 days, PM1 days, um, or even predating those, you would literally go and put your analog channel in. Your wish list. Your wish list, mm -hmm. that's it. And the patch guys or your console tech would literally go and plug in the XLRs the way you wanted them orientated, uh, the layout you wanted. Mm -hmm. It used to take some time and occasionally they'd get it wrong and things like that. Um, and for the longest time, we still did that. And back, if you look at that, that photo I threw up from Instagram, we still had um, a handful of SD racks and, um, well, not a handful, we had a lot of SD racks, uh, mm. you know, profile racks, student racks, things like that, that we would literally still have to plug the XLR into because when you referenced the patch sheet, the console operator, the engineer would still expect that input to show up on that physical input. Mm. Um, soft patching wasn't really a, it wasn't really a big thing um, no. not even a few years ago, uh, mm. you know, it kind of, that, that came a lot later when we started sharing stage racks. Yeah. So you would put that in there, you would label it, um, and away you go. So you see we've got front house one, front house two. So typically that's the band console. That's the host console, uh, monitors, obviously this year, that year we only did one monitor console. Sometimes some years we'd run two. Um, I've got a Maddie routing block here because typically the SD racks would natively come out MADI at 48K, hit the read or medial net and would appear on the other side and show up as MADI for the broadcast console. Uh, and then we also went and put a, uh, a Pro Tools matrix in there too. So typically Pro Tools would be, uh, and if you're familiar with Pro Tools, it would be A1 through to 8, B1 through to 8, C1 through to 8. D1 through to eight, because trying to do the math in your head to work out where a signal is going to show up uh, in rel like in Pro Tools is like, it was so much easier just to look at a document. Um, so, so yeah, that was, uh, that's more or less how we ran it. And then later on, we would start getting to the point where we started sharing stage tracks and filling the channel column in became less relevant mm. because it didn't really matter. Uh, mm. And and on a, it probably mattered more on the Midas than it did on the Digicos. On the Digicos, no one looks at the channel number. You know, no one says it's in channel forty three. They'll say it might be in SD rack A forty three, but no one actually references the channel strip number because you lay out the board however you want, mm, right? Yeah. It doesn't really matter. Um, so it became less and less relevant as long as the input appeared. At, a, at an SD rack or it was on the network, it was available. Yeah. Um, and everyone got used to that. So um, hence why there was like, you know, less and less details and to the point where you can even start folding these columns in. And, and there's been a, you know, a couple of years where I'm like, do we even need the columns? You know what I mean? We just need to know where, where the console operator can pick that signal up off the network. You know, the only thing we really need to sort of worry about is where it gets complex when it goes via Maddie to Medianet and then out of Medianet and it goes through various routers on the Hills campus uh, to get to the broadcast consoles or Pro Tools or Reaper or um, sound devices, SD970s, whatever. You know, we've got a myriad of recorders and backup recorders here. So, yeah. That's so it. why are there, a, why are there, why are there gaps in the patch? Yeah. Ah. You got Creat it. Creative freedom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no, so, no. <laughs> okay. In a perfect world, we would only ever have. Well, we don't have two guitars, but we know there's going to be a third guitar that's going to show up. Or a fourth. Yeah. And or a fourth. Fifth. Yeah, <laughs> and a fourth. So, <laughs> voila, that's where guitar number four goes. Because let's. Uh, you know, sure. There's mm. going to be four. Like you know, someone shows up with a fourth guitar. We'd insert that right there. Yeah. Uh, same deal with the keys. Yep. We would allow for two lots of stereo keys. 
typically we know from experience there's going to be a third stereo set of keys yep. uh item lines we've allowed 10 item lines um we must have we must have put our foot down that year because sometimes that'll be up to 12. Yeah. Usually it's um, 12 now yeah. It's usually it's 12 now yeah. And then we go to uh, acoustics now. Four acoustics. Two which are already catered for with J48s on stage. Another two we know have the potential to show up uh because you're talking about worship leaders here so the worship leader might walk up on stage and they're holding an acoustic they might walk up on stage and they're not holding an acoustic so you kind of just have to be ready for that. Um, and we've also done things due to the stage layout sometimes because we, you know, when you are in the round, which we've done quite a lot, we've just had four, let's call them four worship leader positions and we've dropped four acoustics. And so we're, you know, if you're yeah, in position options. one, two, three or four, yep. there's, you just pick those up because um, sometimes the creative element of the stage means it's quite hard to get under there and rerun cables. That's right, yeah. yeah. And a lot of the time we will, um, we'll have the, uh, the stage guys, the stage audio team loop stage boxes through. So a, um, a single analog input will appear in two places. Um, but with the, the, the sheer quantity of channel count that we have these days on these consoles, we can just give everyone, like, you know, give all those positions their own inputs. Hmm. Um, which kind of makes it. I can't see the euphonium in the patch, Ricky. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> gone. So, back, um, back on that question on gaps, if you have a look, Ricky, there's the, the worship input list. Mm -hmm. And then we've got the united list, which um, jumps on top yeah. of that. True. Yep, so, yes. you can see where there's gaps in the, in the worship band. That's right. Um, yeah. They're filled in by other bits filled in by united, for yeah. united. Correct. Um, that would so be intentional. Than, bunch of all up stage stuff and have to unpatch it drop it down or, or drop things on the end yep just leave gaps for the the biggest that you know come to one way really. that's yeah. it yeah take your biggest act and uh <laughs> work backwards work backwards yeah. that's right yeah. yeah um if you've ever done a festival that'll be very familiar to you um so yep so as you can see there um united user percussion sampler stereo lines we've allowed for it here uh, United have the potential for Joel to play electric. That's allowed for here. Um, and same with the keys. We don't have a Pro D2, um, or we wouldn't use a Pro D2 anyway, so I'm not sure why that's <laughs> written there, but we would use a JDI duplex or something similar. Um, but United have uh, a mid, you know, a mid stage keys. Um, and then we would reuse our item lines for the United tracks lines. Um, so there is, there is a lot of thought and there is some sort of, um, there's method to the madness um, a lot of the time, as Jazzy definitely pointed out there. Um, the big gap here is more so probably because you never know what's going to happen. So we just, mm. we just do leave if, you know, roughly like that's the band, the band are finished and the band are in reality are what, you know, um, what are you looking at here? 46 lines, realistically, mm -hmm. without tracks. Um, so we would go and drop the choir in right at the end. Uh, and this was back when we ran lines for the choir. These days we use the DPA 409070, um, DPA's choir mic system with the stems. Um, and I've, I've become quite partial to uh, putting the belt pack at the bottom and making the choir mics wireless. Uh, simply for ease of the stage management, uh, walking on and off with those things. It's a whole lot easier if they're not plugging XLRs in. There's no risk of a console operator not muting that input when they go to strike the, the mic off stage and unplugging that XLR, considering it's a condenser and it's obviously going to have phantom power on it. Um, so, yeah, and um, we can check, you know, when they're off stage, they're always transmitting, so you can test them. You can do a quick line check before they walk up on stage. You don't have to wait until they're in position and they plug the XLR in to find out that it's not working. Um, so, yeah, that's the that's back when we used to use uh, lots of Sennheiser nylon fours. But the choir mics change depending on the type of choir and the if it's an item versus a consistent choir or, or you know what the what the creative um, what the creative brief dictates, I guess. Yeah. Um, so, and then, um, you know, music director mics, uh, one's UXD. So we do, um, so our primary music director mic is wireless. 
uh, because it could be on stage left or stage right. And inst again, instead of moving XLRs around, it was just a whole lot easier just to make it a wireless mic. Um, yeah. Could be a keyboard player, could be a guitarist, could be, you know, anything. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. bass synth. Bass synth, yeah. Lonely old bass synth. Yeah. Um, so, again, this is sort of a, uh, this is a um, remnants of a, uh, hey guys, we want to run a bass synth. It's like, oh, okay. Which now well, we just do that all the time. But. Exactly, yep. So, that would normally appear up here somewhere as part of the bass rig. Yeah. Um, and then uh, a lot of uh, ancillary inputs, um, you know, uh, click drum, uh, sorry, not click drum, ugh. sorry, uh, drum click from the drummer, uh, his local click, uh, triggers from the kit um, for, for two reasons. Primary reason is it drives, you typically drives the gates on the console um, and they just hit a mic pre, like you can see over here. Uh, sometimes, rarely, Croft, you can, you can talk more into this, but occasionally the studio guys take those and we'll replace them. Yeah. Using, or they're using, using the trigger, the trigger sample. trigger samples. Yep. Yeah. Um, Cause they literally just show up as a click in the wave file. Um, cool. And then we move on to our vocal mics, um, which are C. So that's typically a third SD rack or these days we've been taking the more in via NLR, via AES, or um, even moving them over to Dante in the future. For um, because what we've discovered is uh, we've flip flop. We've gone back and forth between. Um, so, for example, we use Shure Axiom Digital on our vocals, and the first time we used those, we ran them on AES at 96K into AES cards on the SD rack and everyone thought they sounded great and that was awesome. And we kept doing it and kept doing it, kept doing it. And then one year, uh, sorry, color just gone by, we caught, we went, well, let's just keep it simple and uh, we'll just plug them in via analog. And everyone noticed the difference. So, uh, so from now on, they will be AES. Yeah, or, they sound you know. awesome at AES. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So on so digital, they, they sound super clean. It's really silent, um, you know. And that's where these guys come in. The, the, the Sennheiser, the digital 6000s with, uh, with the DPA capsules. Um, the DPA was a choice we made uh, here at the Hills campus because, you know, who knows where they're going to hold the mic. You needed something that had really good, um, that could deal with the proximity effect really well. Uh, and because this is our primary broadcast location, we are getting a lot of complaints from our post-production guys about the noise floor of the radio mic systems. So we made a decision based on, uh, considering we're gonna use the same DPA capsule anyway, um, the decision came down to what was the lowest noise floor on analog AES and Dante. And uh, that's Dante at 96K. And uh, the D6000 was, um, was a clear winner there. So that, that basically was dead silent. So, you know, so that's mm -hmm. sort of, we've listed here direct on AES. Um, so yeah, um, all right. I think um, what we might do is that covers, unless there's um, any more questions. There's a few. So we have one, how do you handle taking patch from ICC to CC like we did this March? Why don't you uh, talk about that, Fads? Um, this was a very special patch <laughs> this past car. So we had the oh, situation. I didn't mean that, but just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, we under the bus. <laughs> yeah. No, we um. So we were. We did one part of the color conference at the ICC in uh, Darling Harbour, Sydney, and the other part at our Hills campus. And obviously, the goal was to have the patch remain as similar as possible. Um, which was a bit of a challenge because Hills, you know, has been around for a long time. There's a lot of stuff run a certain way as we've heard about Ricky's BSM routing and all this other stuff. And then making it work at the ICC. So we kind of took the Hills patch and tried to emulate that as much as possible in the ICC, um, which I, I did most of that. and. I learned a lot of things along the way, especially after um, the cue point guys had their say in fixing it as they have in the past. And yeah, so we just tried to make it as similar as possible. 
and which was difficult with some things like SD rack cards, you know, do we get the exact same SD rack cards for color in the ICC? We ended up not doing that, but yeah, it all worked out in the end, I would say. But yeah, we did make a new patch list of kind of emerged hills and conference patch. And, and, you know, over the years, sometimes things that have evolved or come from conferences, that then, uh, you know, had flow on effects to church patch, you know, like the base yeah. synth, where we've just all gone, let's just have the three lines all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it, it is always an evolving thing, you know, as long as I've been involved, the patch changes, grows, gets out of control, come, gets all pulled back, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a, it's an always evolving thing. Yes, yeah, so that was good. The band inputs were simple. We have pretty much the same ones in both places. So, yeah. And then, do you guys run 96K for the entire conference? Uh, yes. So the console network, the optical network is at 96K. Um, the, we do the MADI outputs on the SD rack is that runs at half clock. So that's 48 K and that to feed into the feed, those MADI signals into media net to be transported back to the C, the, the Hills convention center for the broadcast guys to use yeah. there. But yeah, otherwise the, the console network and the PA are both at 96 K. Yeah. Cool. Um, any other questions before we move on? I think so. Okay, cool. Um, oh, wait. So, uh, there's one more de facto 2028 is a de facto. So yeah. that's the DPA cap. Um, cool. All right. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically, um, I'm going to sort of uh, throw a curveball to sort of uh, to Croft and, and Matto here. Let's talk about our mic choices. So, um, Fisty cuffs. Yep. I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs> I'm going to throw up uh, the, the patch again. And, I, didn't uh, notice, I already noticed in there. I'm like, there's some marks on there. That, oh, man, that's oh, been outdated marks. Not use. Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of these are, um, are like... That, that, to me, just, that looks like some cut and paste. That is some things. cut and paste, yep. Mm -hmm. That is some cut and paste. This is not a good example, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, although, okay, so we'll start off with... Uh, so, you know, the, the, our, our current... Our current kick mic combination, it's the uh, Sasseni E901 and the Audix D6. Yep. You guys, I'll jump. I'll jump. Yep. I'll jump in happily here. You Go know, for the, it. The, the ultimately the the Sennheiser, you know, got driven by Brad Law, um, you know, because he's done did monitors for such a long time, and all of us have you know, quite happily gone. Yep, great. You know, um, personally, I'll I'll sort of I don't mind. I'll use a BD91 or whatever. But we we've all gotten used to the Senny. Um, so we try and keep it consistent. One thing I will say though, the kick out mic we've changed over the years and guys, will, you know, any, any of you guys will know this. I'll normally have multiples on site, you know, so we'll, we'll probably have a beat of 52. Sometimes there's been RE twenties, um, you know, M 88s on site. And, and if we're not happy, if we're not getting what we need from a mic, we'll go down, we'll swap it out. Um, yeah, you know, obviously we'll go listen to the drum. Um, so if we blow it up, or if we blow it up, yes, <laughs> you know. Um, Didn't we kill two beta fifty twos one year? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. Too, too, mm -hmm. too small a hole in the kick. Yep, man, someone um, with a big right leg. Yes. Oh my god. Yeah. And you can see a fifty two uh, on the United patch though. Yeah. Yeah. The United so, boys love a fifty two. So. Yeah, so we'll definitely quite happily change things. What I will say, you know, we have we have good healthy banter over this. You know, um, people might say, oh, I really want to try this. And, and I would like to say that we're always open to trying something, but also happy to go, oh, no, what we had actually worked, you know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but there's never, a, I, I don't think anyone's ever gone straight flat out. No, I'm not going to try that mic. Um, yeah. Um, what else is on this one? Yeah, 57s is pretty much standard. That's right? standard. standard across the top of the board. So I'm talking, okay. So where, where we've had a, a quite a few changes lately would be these guys. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't even remember. I don't think we've ever used two one fours on a conference. It's probably no, that's that's a copy and paste yeah. incident right there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the the hats has evolved. I mean, oh, geez, I remember miking a stage with an SM eighty one once. Uh, uh, thank goodness those days are over. Um, Oh, they that are was the standard for way too long. I know. Oh, yeah, that's it. Um, you know, so I use them for hammers and oh, yeah. all sorts of stuff. Keep yeah. you know wedge doors open, things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, so the the E nine oh one is it, sorry the the nine one four is kind of our def, our house default. Um, but more recently on conferences for the last few years, we've actually been using the Mojave MA one hundred one FET, um, mm -hmm. which is a little fancy, but that's uh, it pulls a nice sparkly result. Um, Tom's, we, I mean, once upon a time it was beta 98 and then it was, uh, beta 56s and then it was, uh, uh, e, uh Sennheiser E904s. 904s, yeah. Yep. yep. Um, and then there was, uh, and then we kind of, we wanted some more clarity and tonality out of the Tom's and, um. I did years ago, I did a, 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 a long time ago, I did a tour with, uh, with Planet Shakers and uh, their front house guy at the time, Brian Vaylor, was using the Audio Technica AE3000s, um, which are those yeah. little baby mini uh, large diaphragm microphones. And uh, Mike Weber, who's with us now, is now was the drummer and it sounded, the tom sounded incredible. And I was like, these things are awesome. So we, we uh, years later, I sort of, when I had some influence over that, I could. I sort of brought those back and said, let's try those again. And uh, varying degrees of success. Uh, a lot of, some people loved them. Some people hated them. Mm. Um, some people took some time to get used to them. Uh, then we, um, we kind of evolved from that and went to the, the DPAs, uh, the 4099s. But uh, Matt, why don't you tell us your experience about uh, <laughs> condenser, condenser mics on drum kits? So, I don't want to bash DPA because I think they sound great on toms. I really do. Um, but I personally have struggled to gate them in a way that drummers don't freak out about and to get the tone and, you know, the tonality and low end out of a tom in an in-ear mix that I would look for, I have to boost it and the spill quite a bit. And that's been my experience with those. So I'm always willing to try them and I like using them. But yeah, I like A three thousands or nano nano fours better personally. M twenty fives. That's going back a bit. Uh, we yeah, would never I, use uh, AKG two one fours on overheads. That is a copy and paste error. Um, we four one fours. We would use four one fours. That was a that was a standard a, for a long time. Uh, these days, we uh, if we're not doing an album record, it's it's a different. Um, I mean, if we're doing an album record, this line list looks very different anyway. Yeah. Um, Tom's, for example, would be uh, Sennheiser MD421s. Yeah. Um, there would probably be a third kick my, uh, line. Now, I'll throw this in. Yep. I'll take 421s any old day of the week. But just because we change drummers, like, like we go from a left-handed kit to a right-handed kit. Yep. And, and unfortunately... They fall off the stands. They're cumbersome. Uh, trying to get them in, like, you know, to here's your tone, right here's your symbol. And, and, like, and where do I get them in? So um, I'll take four. It was the, the not using 421s was definitely never, uh, you know, yeah, it, it was just, there's very, very in fact is that they just, they bit us many times and fell off and, yeah, had, had yeah. other issues. Yeah, the, yeah, because if, if they get worn out, the little clip, the sliding on clip, Mm. Um, if that mechanism's broken, it will literally just slide off on you. Um, yeah. uh, if drummers like where to get them in the optimal position, drummers have a tendency to want to whack them. Some, you know, <laughs> yes. like so, you know that happens. Um, yeah, so no, four two one's definitely on toms, uh, hands down. But um, just, just before the, we keep going, yep. there's a good question that actually relates. Um, how much do we have a say in drum skins and what goes on drums since it can make a difference, you know, could affect yes. what mic we might choose. Yes. Yes. Uh, we have robust conversations. Mm. Um, <laughs> the, well, the, I, I'm going to say yeah. that we, we get involved because people, you know, in last year I was, you know, 
we get involved in what the, what the drum kit is. Like the musos yeah. reach out to us. We definitely have a healthy, in the same way, they, they, you know, it's like, we'd like this. Are you happy with that? And we definitely have the privilege of getting involved in that discussion. Um, down to what kit, what heads. Sometimes people, you know, uh, may not be happy, but they they will always try and work for the greater, you know, greater Yeah, that's best. right. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, exactly. It's really about the big picture, the end goal. Um, you know, not just what your favorite kid is or, you know, you're, you know, you're trying to score an endorsement with somebody. So you, you, you know, you, you've got an, another agenda, but, um, so yeah, a drummers, uh, and a lot of the time, um, especially when, cause a lot of these conferences are in the round and, a kit that works well in a small church building may not sound any good in a large arena. Or uh, so the, rock. or stadium, you know, so that you, so you got it, your, your kit choice, your uh, skin choice, the tuning, it's all got to go up a few notches and you really got to pay attention to it because it makes a world of difference. So, yeah. So, to, I mean, to, and to quickly finish off the kit, um, these days we use uh, Mojave MA301 FETs. Um, we've got those in our conference kit. So Hillsong owns those um, for specifically for conferences. Uh, we don't get them for the rental companies. Um, and then everything from that point becomes, you know, drum pads and digital uh, effects, you know, percussive things. Uh, Cool. Pretty, so pretty much we've standardized on the radials. We did that a number of years ago. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I mean, it you know, just the, the transition from the clerks and the countrymen's it's quite a logical transition. Yeah. But the, and you'd also, you'd get like, um, especially when it came to the acoustics, the, you'd get really good results with the countrymen and you go to a clerk and it doesn't, it's not quite right, but then you get another acoustic that'll sound really good. And a lot of it's the impedance matching of it. Yeah. Um, but we just found that the radials just worked on everything. Yeah. Like it just worked except for like the piezo DI, which we use for like strings and things like that. They're, they're different. Um, that's a whole different thing, but yeah, we found the, um, the, the radials just worked. Mm. They were, you know, they were silent. The passive JDIs were really good. When you hit the ground lift, works um when you hit the pad it's actually 20 db or it's 10 db or whatever the you know it's written on the side yeah. um all that sort of stuff so and they're and they're robust they you could drop them off you know you could drop them off the stage pick it back up plug it in and know it's going to work yeah. so yeah they're 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 just solid um nice. so yeah um cool well yeah as we go through this list i mean we're sort of we're we're, we're, we're gone over time so we'll kind of quickly run through the rest of the, the line list. I mean, at the moment, there's so much emphasis on the drums and the rest of it are all pretty simple, really. Um, a lot of things we'll add as well that we didn't kind of cover here is um, quickly while I just, rem rem uh, before when I mentioned record, we will add um, more DIs for electric guitars. Um, if we're doing a, a big record at a conference where we will literally uh, straight out of the electric guitar into a DI loop out of the DI into the guitarist pedal board. And we'll add those to the input list and record those. And that's so the studio later on, the studio guys can reamp those um, either through the guitarist same rig or another guitarist rig or this, all the, all the gear they got in the studio. But um, the guys are pretty keen on reamping to sort of nail the tones. Um, you know, uh, Croft, you would have done a bunch of that. Hmm. Yeah, it just helps. It's also, even for editing as well, a clean guitar compared to a distorted guitar is actually a much easier waveform to edit. Yeah, I can Not that we that. do any editing. That's right, but, it's all live. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, the rest of the input list is pretty simple. Uh, bass, bunch of, you know, radial J48s, guitars, 57s. We have messed around with um, Royers, uh, Palmer DIs, uh, 421s, C four one fours. Uh one stage there was like audio technica. ATM twenty five. <laughs> um <laughs> uh AT forty forties. Yep. Um so things like that. I mean a, a lot some of the guitarists will have some opinion on what mics they would like their guitars. Uh, some some guitarists actually own their own mics and they're like, 
here's my ribbon and here's my, so, you know, um, for example, Nige, uh, I mean, you know, probably our, one of our most famous guitarists, Nigel, he actually, uh, he favors, he's got an audio technical ribbon and an MD421 and he, fa that's his favorite mic choice at the moment. Um, so he, he really sort of, he, he doesn't mind bringing his own mics to, and, and knows if he plugs those in, these are the, this is the sound he expects and he's going to get. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And uh, as I discussed, we talked about uh, vocal mics or, you know, straight up uh, either SM or beta 58s. Um, the choir is no longer 914s, but they're now the, um, the DPA 4097s. Um, and the rest of it's all DIs, things that we don't really aren't too concerned about, like producer mics, shout mics, MD mics. They're typically... And this is sort of a, an availability and a budget thing, but they're always sort of ULXD or, um, although at color they were sure AD, but that was just because that was what's available. Um, as simple as that, really. Uh, talkbacks are always uh, 935s or 945s switched mics. Um, uh, I'm surprised no one's asked about OptiGates on MD mics. We went through a stage of using OptiGates, uh, but they kind of died off and no one really cared because the processing available on a channel strip between uh, compression and expansion and DSing, you can make it work really. You can achieve the same effect. Um, or close I'd enough. I'd be keen to try them again, personally. <laughs> okay. That means going back to a wired. So if someone could make a wireless fine me. insert for uh, an OptiGate insert for a, a wireless mic, that'd be amazing. Meta would love it. Have so, we always used 58s on vocals? Have we always? Uh, there when is I, a when I first started, it was beta eighty sevens, and I got rid of that very quickly. Yeah, that was I remember bad. that. They were Trevor's favorite. Oh wow! Like yes, <laughs> too many yeses. Say that. They, they, <laughs> yeah, wow, that seven K was special. But when they were, you needed the uh, what was it? The DPR four hundred twos. Yeah, you needed racks of them. Oh yeah, you need racks of DSs. I, I, I'll throw this in because this is something that I've been, you guys know, I've, this is something where, again, we have healthy conversation about, um, you know, because we have so many singers and people change all the time. There's lots of great microphone capsules out there um, mm. and, uh, you know, young and free tour and they've got different capsules for each person and stuff. But for conferences oh. and for church, I, I'm like, let's just stick and, and, I don't want to say you're, you're settling for something that's average, but you're settling for something that works on everyone every day. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I've never struggled to make a beta 58 sound good, um, but it's about what's best for everyone. Um, yeah. So that's, that's what I tend to drive that going. Let's just sit with that. The singers know how to sing into them. Most, mm -hmm. you know, everyone's sung into a 58 or a beta 58 and they know how it performs when they get on and off it. Um, and how the proximity works. So yep, that's yeah, that's it. That's the thing it's, in conference, right? You've got twelve vocal mics, and we use what eight or ten of them in you know for our AM session. Yeah, yep. yeah. And then we'll transition to an item, which literally takes seconds, if not a minute or two, to swap yeah. between the the worship band and item exactly. setup. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have the luxury of saying, "Oh, I need I need this capsule on this person." Yeah. This person. Exactly. So we don't have the time yep. to change. It. No. So. If it's a if it's a guest artist or a guest band, like in this case we're using, I mean United used Beta Fifty Eights anyway. Yep. For example, if Young and Free were playing a full set, then we would take the Young and Free uh, SEV Sevens, I think. No, we so, use M Eighties. M Eighties. There mm -hmm. you go. We would go and put the M Eighties on. Yeah. Um, and uh, we've, I mean, we've tried SEV Sevens and we've tried a bunch of other stuff in the past. Um, and I mean, we've gone down the. That, that, that's the SE one, isn't it? The... Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I like that's a good sounding mic. Yep. CV7. Yeah. Yeah, it awesome. is actually. Yep. Yeah, they're awesome. Um, and it does a good job of keeping the spill out. So uh, we have a few here at the Hills Convention Center, and um, I'll kind of look at the, the roster of who's singing and what position, where they are on stage. And if it's the two vocals that are over in front of the drum kit, <laughs> quite often I'll, they will be the first ones I swap out to the SEV7s um, to keep the spill down. So, yeah, okay. Uh, any last questions before we um, wrap it up? 
Uh, we have one from Adam. How did your mic choice differ when not at a conference at Hills or other campuses? Maybe we can quickly answer. That's, um, it's, it's, it's pretty, I mean, what you saw there, uh, a lot of locations will use, like they will use the 214s for overheads. Mm -hmm. They would use um, either E904s or AE3000s for Tom mics. They will, most locations are 901 and D6. Uh, it's pretty sort of generic and standard. Um, you know, a lot of SM57s, a lot of radial DIs. Um, yeah, things like that. I just saw another one, uh, SM7B, the standard Vox studio mic, Croft. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it definitely, you know, it's, again, it's become a really good uh, workhorse in that environment. Um, yeah, you know, you just got to remember it is a, it's a little bit low gain. Yeah, you yeah. Know, I mean, and we've got a bunch of these things. Um, so I've got a bunch of RE20s and things like that. And if you look through various clips, you'll see Taylor on an RE20, then you'll see her on an SM7B, and then you'll see you on some fancy $10,000 mic. You know, it's, yeah. It's not, um, there's no hard and fast rule. It's kind of, uh, depending on the session, where they're recording, what's available at the time. Yeah. At the moment, there's an awful lot of content being created. So resources are sort of spread thin. Um, the Shore distributor in Australia had a good stock of SM7Bs. Uh, so we, they were available. We could buy a bunch of them. So when we needed to record uh, Praise and Worship, that was sort of, you know, either acoustic or uh, socially distant. So, you know, that was spread out around the studio. SM7Bs were available. Um, and, and like Croft said, they're, they're a great workhorse. They just work. Sweet. Cool. All right. Um, is that it? Yeah. Great. All right. All right. Thanks everyone for joining us this week. Uh, we'll be back next week and uh, keep an eye out on Instagram where we release the, uh, the topics we'll be discussing. And again, if you guys want to go and, Hit us up on Instagram. You can make your comments, drop the questions, um, sort suggest, of. Suggest sound effects. Suggest sound effects. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's going to be a new one. So, you know, um, it'll, uh, you know, these are now up on YouTube. So for all the guys asking about YouTube, when I say guys, I mean guys and girls. It's just an Aussie slang thing to say guys. Um, so. It's just what's fine. <laughs> yep. It works fine. So it's, um, yeah, these are up now. Um, just search for, uh, uh, audio webinar series or search for um, Hillsong Creative um, because it's actually under the Hillsong, Hillsong Worship, and, Worship Creative and Creative account yeah. Yeah. Uh, on YouTube. So, uh, But yet they're all available. This one will be available in a couple of days. Um, but like I said, uh, keep an eye out on Instagram. If you're not following, uh, go follow HS Creative Technology and, um, and keep an eye out. And uh, that's where we'll post what's coming up. And that's where you guys can go and make comments and drop your questions. So nice. uh, yeah. Thanks everyone for coming and we'll see you again next week. See you guys. See ya.